Well, hi everyone. The I-5 Interstate Project, which connects Portland to Vancouver, Washington, just got a major boost recently with the announcement of a mega grant from the federal government to fund this project in part. So I'm gonna go through some of the technical aspects of this job, what's the big picture for this project, what the impacts are gonna be, and just go through it in a pretty good detail, I think. Interstate 5 is the only north-south interstate in the west connecting traffic from Mexico through the US into Canada. The existing northbound portion of this bridge was completed in 1917. Originally, the bridge was two lanes carrying traffic in each direction. The bridge was added to the interstate highway system in 1957 and was significantly upgraded in 1958, which is the time the southbound bridge was constructed and placed into service. Costs for this new bridge are expected to be as much as $7.5 billion. That's with the B, which would make it among the most expensive bridge projects in the United States. The breakdown for these costs is $2.5 billion for the bridge itself, $2 billion for a light rail line that goes across the bridge, $3 billion for new interchanges and the approaches. This bridge project isn't fully funded yet. Currently, there's $1 billion from the state of Washington that's been committed, $1 billion from the state of Oregon, the $600 million grant that I mentioned just a minute ago, and anticipated $1.2 billion from tolling. The rest of the funding is expected to be made up through federal grants, some of which have to be awarded on a competitive basis. The current bridges have list spans that permits a clear height of 176 feet over the Columbia River. This river is 30 feet deep approximately and a half mile wide at this crossing. The list spans are operated 300 to 400 times a year, which is about once a day on average, which causes major traffic congestion due to the halt in traffic while these spans are moving up and down. The proposed new bridge will have a fixed deck, that is there's no lift span, with a clear height of 116 feet over the Columbia River. The U.S. Coast Guard wants the new bridge to maintain the current 176 foot clear height for passing river traffic, but again, this would require a lift span. So the Coast Guard's gonna have to sign off on this bridge project prior to the start of construction, and it's not clear how insistent they are on maintaining this clear height over the, over the channel on the Columbia River. But you know, the current operation of that bridge is causing problems because it interferes with the airspace on the approaches to nearby airports. The new bridge wouldn't have those issues. The current bridge has a total of six lanes, three in the north direction and three in the south direction. The replacement bridge is gonna have a total of eight traffic lanes, four in each direction. There'll also be pedestrian and bicycle lanes and the light rail line that I mentioned. Construction associated with this bridge project is expected to start in the year 2025 and be completed somewhere around the year 2035. The existing bridges cost over $1.2 million each year just to maintain. The existing bridge lanes are relatively narrow, particularly in comparison with modern design requirements and traffic needs. For these existing bridges, there are over 146,000 daily vehicle crossings. So these two bridges are carrying significant traffic volumes. The existing bridge piers are supported by driven timber pile foundations. These are relatively shallow foundations and extend to a sand layer in the channel of the Columbia River. Here's some pictures and video for installation of timber piles, which are basically tree trunks with the branches stripped off. These piles are tapered with the largest portion at the top, which is impacted during driving, and the pile tapers to smaller and smaller diameters towards the tip. Now, as most people know, the Pacific Northwest is an area of high seismic risk. In fact, these soil deposits are susceptible to seismically induced liquefaction. That is, when an earthquake ground shaking occurs, water pressures build up, poor water pressures, in the sandy soils, which reduces the resistance of the pile soil interface. So the soil particles are impinging on the pile interface with less stress, and over the area of the pile, that computes to less force, supporting the piling. If the poor water pressures build up great enough, with the existing bridge loading on the piling, it causes the piles to plunge, which causes settlement of the bridge superstructure such that spans can rotate and fall off the piers into the river. There's no doubt for the replacement bridges for this project, the foundations will consist of either probably open-ended steel pipe pile driven to bedrock, or drilled shaft foundations extending to bedrock. Here's a couple of video segments showing these different foundation types. The interstate bridge replacement project released this animation showing what could happen to the existing bridges in the event of a large earthquake.
Now, this animation is just shocking in the amount of devastation that they anticipate could occur. Notice that this animation doesn't show any cars, trucks, or pedestrians who would undoubtedly be on this bridge deck in the event of an earthquake and collapse. This mechanism of seismically induced liquefaction is what caused damage to the Bay Bridge in 1989 due to the Loma Prieta earthquake. This bridge has subsequently been upgraded to withstand these seismic loads. Here's another bridge. This one's in Japan, the Showa Bridge in Nagata Prefecture. This failure was also due to seismically induced liquefaction of the sandy soil layers in the foundation. This would be similar to what happened with the I-35 bridge collapse in Minneapolis, Minnesota that occurred in August 2007 and killed 13 people and injured nearly 200 people. Although this was a structural failure due to a design flaw and excess loading on the bridge deck, it wasn't related to any foundation issues. The collapse of the I-5 bridges over the Columbia River would undoubtedly be even a greater catastrophe. The previous project to replace these bridges was referred to as the Columbia River Crossing and that effort fell apart in 2013. This was the result of funding problems associated with local officials insisting that the bridge replacement project include a light rail line and also due to environmental issues. The Interstate Bridge Replacement Program is a joint effort between Oregon DOT, Washington DOT, Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, Metro, Southwest Washington Regional Transportation Council, the cities of Portland and Vancouver, the Port of Portland, and the Port of Vancouver. Currently, the design is only at the 10% stage, and at one point, a tunnel option was being considered. That's since been ruled out. As I mentioned, tolling is a part of the funding mechanism for this bridge. The original toll charge for this bridge crossing in 1917 was five cents, which is equivalent to $1.18 today. That's interesting because the current toll charge is anticipated to be between $1.50 and $3.50, and that's most likely per crossing. Now here are the steps for completing this project. Complete the federal environmental review process, which I understand is near completion. Obtain necessary state and federal permits. Finalize project design. Develop a finance plan. Secure adequate funding. Complete right-of-way acquisition. And advertise for construction. Now at this point, I'd like to thank our channel members. I recently offered a single tier membership, and this really helps me continue producing videos at least on a weekly basis. So again, thank you. Now here's the soil bedrock profile at the site of the bridge crossing across the Columbia River. This shows sandy soils, approximately 30 foot water depth, and the sandy alluvial soils extend as much as 200 feet until the contact with the basalt bedrock. You know, one of the things I'll mention is it's always surprising to me that these projects have to have environmental studies that are very extensive considering the fact there's existing bridge there that needs to be replaced. I'm not saying that the environmental studies aren't important. I just don't understand why they couldn't be completed in a shorter time frame. So as a thought experiment, what would happen if there was a major earthquake now before this replacement project occurred? Of course, any damage to the bridge which is highly likely to occur due to a major earthquake loading. What would they do to reopen the bridge? Would they take a year or two doing an environmental study? or would they get after it? The other thing is, would they spend as much money on the extensive interchange work on either end of the bridge? You know, anymore, the interchanges associated with the bridge project can be considerably more expensive than the cost of building the bridge itself. So let me know what you think in the comments section. I'll continue to provide updates as this project winds through its final design phases and enters into construction. Also, check out the link in the description. I have a digital download of the biggest civil engineering disasters for the past 100 years. Thanks for watching, everyone, and please stay tuned for future videos.